Chapter 18, Dissent, the Modern Technology of Repression. It is very important to silence the man who first cries out, the king is naked, before others pick up the cry. Valentin Moroz, Ukrainian Distant. Lost in the unfolding sensations of Alexander Solentsyn's sudden exile in early 74, was the extraordinary fact that for a brief moment in time, the Soviet Union's three leading distants had begun to debate <clears throat> their nation's future. For a country devoid of real political discourse for half a century, it was a remarkable turn of events. It was widely overlooked in the West because the West had long indiscriminately lumped all distance together. Yet here, were three men out of a population of 250 million. Solentsyn, the classic Slavophile moralist, Andrei Sakharov, the 20th century scientific liberal, and Roy Medvedev, the form-minded Marxist historian, daring to infringe publicly on the Communist Party's declared monopoly of social thought to argue about their own prescriptions, for Russia in statements to the Western press that were beamed back to their own people through the instant replay of Western radio broadcasts. It was a development unimaginable a decade earlier, made possible by the protective umbrella of detente and their own frame, their own fame. Yet this debate of the sup super distance was misleading in its way, too, it obscured the fact that dissent as a movement, probably never more than a thousand activists at most, had waned. The technology of Soviet repression had become more sophisticated and more effective as detente proceeded. The unexpected irony was that detente, instead of spawning, more general ferment among the Soviet intelligentsia, as the West had hoped and the Kremlin had feared, became a reason for tighter controls, and sometimes provided new techniques for quieting disaffected intellectuals. Only those of the stature of Solentsyn, Sakharov, and Medvedev could use its shield to deepen the substance of their descent. In those final months before Solentsyn was forcibly ejected, Sakharov was often automatically paired with Solentsyn, vilified in the Soviet press as a renegade and turncoat, who had slandered and betrayed with black ingratitude the motherland which had nurtured him, sanctified in the West as the champion of individual rights a symbol for humanizing detente and opening up the Soviet Union to greater democratization. Solentsyn had won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1970, and Sakharov would win the Nobel Prize in 75. Yet, I found Sakharov and Solentsyn immensely different men. In person, Sakharov hardly seems the man to stir an international uproar. He does not have the imposing presence, the commanding personality, or the combative temperament of Solentsyn, where Solentsyn's would thrust self-confidently to the center of the conversational stage. Sakharov would hover in the wings, a shy, almost homely, unpretentious man, content to listen and reflect, head rolled thoughtfully to one side until he felt sufficiently at home with some newcomer to converse freely. Their physical presence was entirely different. The Solentsyn of barrel chest, lined and ruddy face, work-worn hands, mahogany beard, and penetrating eyes is physically as well as mentally powerful. He fought for eminence late in life as he had earlier fought for life itself, and when it suited him, he relished prestige and the limelight. By contrast, Sakharov 
emanates vulnerability, he is a tall but slightly stooped figure with high intellectual forehead and two patches of thinning gray hair bordering his baldness, large hands unscarred by physical labor, and sad, compassionate eyes. He is an inward man, a Russian intelligent and intellectual through and through. In his reticence and his con conversational lapses, one senses the solitary thinker. His own natural penchant for privacy was reinforced by two decades of enforced privacy in the Soviet nuclear research program, where outside contacts were forbidden and a personal bodyguard moved with him everywhere, even when he went swimming. Puckishly, he told me, he had once given the guard the slip to go off skiing in the woods. His unprecedented Soviet awards and decorations won him no public fame, since they were bestowed in secrecy. His picture had not been printed in the press. My colleague, Ted Shabad, saw him walk into a grocery unshaven and in a rumpled raincoat looking for something to celebrate the birth of his first grandchild and pass all but unnoticed and unrecognized. A theoretical physicist of the stature of Oppenheimer and Teller Sakharov gained eminence naturally, easily, and early in life as one of the fathers of the Soviet hydrogen bomb. His meteoric scientific career, Doctor of Science at 26, full member of the Academy of Sciences at the unheard of age of 32, earned him high position, an early fortune of nearly 140,000 rubles, and direct access to the pinnacle of the Soviet system. One of his first acts of descent was a note scribbled to Khrushchev during a Kremlin meeting in which he objected to 100 megaton nuclear test as technically unnecessary, politically risky, and biologically harmful because of radioactive fallout. For a decade, he voiced such misgivings only within the rarefied atmosphere of the Soviet elite. Abroad, Sakharov's name was unknown until 68, when his mem memorandum, Progress peaceful coexistence and intellectual freedom, advocating an end to the arms race, proposing detente and urging convergence of the socialist and capitalist systems leaked out to the West. Only thereafter did Sakharov begin to use his intellectual eminence in a public way, and then sparingly at first. Unlike Solinsen, his instinct is to avoid the limelight. For months, I tried, as did others, to persuade him to allow an interview or a journalistic portrait, but he shied away from personal publicity. Only with reluctance, feeling cornered and falsely accused by a shrill propaganda campaign in the Soviet press, did he take his personal problems to the world press in the fall of 73. A kind of Grant Wood American Gothic simplicity and modesty permeate Sakharov's life. He is modest in gesture and manner and dress and surroundings. He gave away his accumulated fortune for cancer research, feeling that it was blood money earned from weapons of mass destruction. As plain as an off-duty night watchman, he would pad around his modest apartment in baggy pants, strung from pencil-thin suspenders and in stockinged feet not bother bothering to change when guests arrived. As a concession to social convention, he would don a charcoal gray suit with a nondescript clip-on, four in hand tie over a white or even a gray work shirt to go to the theater. His apartment was, an unpretentious, was, was as unpretentious as Sakharov himself. He shared two rooms and a kitchen with his second wife, Yelena, her mother and her son. For morning callers, bedclothes were tucked away to convert a modest main bedroom into an equally modest living room. A foam rubber double bed couch on a faded oriental rug, a typewriter, and an old-fashioned phonograph 
piled near a glass front bookcase jammed with papers, a pan tied to a window radiator to catch drips because of the inevitable apartment space squeeze, skis were stored next to the flush bowl and a tiny toilet. Ice skates dangled closely overhead. The first time someone took me to his apartment, we arrived to find it in a total turmoil for repairs. With instinctive Russian hospitality, a brief apology for the mess, Sakharov led us directly to the kitchen where an enamel top table was littered with dishes, teacups, and stray saucers. Andrei Dmitrievich, as Russians call him, using his first name and patronymic, was drinking tea sweetened, or rather flavored, with chunks of little hard green apples. It's my favorite way of drinking tea, he remarked, in answer to my curious glance. They used to say that the nobility had tea with lemon, and the cooks had tea with apples, volunteered his wife. So this is cook's tea. Gently, Sakharov urged me to try his cook's tea, and I did. One cup was enough. I had the next cup with sugar. A carton of plain biscuits was produced, and then a small box of assorted candies. A few odd chocolates mixed with other sweets. Everything was very plain. Seven people squeezed around a little table, in a thoroughly Russian way. Visitors were absorbed into life as it was and made to feel at home. No one made any effort to dress things up. It was that way every time I went, for Sakharov is utterly devoid of pretension, yet private, reticent, and soft-spoken. As he is, Sakharov is direct in his emotions. When moved, he has a vibrant sense of outrage at injustice, a quick and deep compassion for the suffering of others, a naive directness of action and speech, heedless of the personal consequences, though threats and harassment against his family have pained him acutely. Over the years, the authorities have played up his streak of naive idealism when trying to discredit his unorthodox views among other intellectuals. Party spokesmen in private lectures to scientists have ridiculed him as a naive eccentric, a well-meaning but hopelessly unrealistic, unworldly thinker. In September of 73, when the Soviet press flowed with daily denunciations against Sakharov, signed by leading Soviet scholars and public figures, the propaganda crescendo stirred sentiments for putting him in a mental hospital, recalling the treatment of the distant 19th century biologist and philosopher Pyotr Shadyev, whom the Tsar had declared insane for his dissenting views. I have heard Sakharov, who has a good enough sense of humor to smile at the tragic irony of being a prophet without honor in his own country, joke about being treated as a half-sainted, half-demented maverick, and he showed enough perspective about his own limited influence and that of the Human Rights Committee, which he formed with two other physicists in 1970, <clears throat> to have kiddingly dismissed it as the Piswick Pick Wick Committee, a jibe at its windy ineffic inefficacy. Some Westerners who have met him have come away wondering why so powerful a state as the Soviet Union treats a man like Sakharov as a political threat. Others have asked aloud how so meek-mannered a soul brought down on his own head the orchestrated wrath of the Soviet establishment, as he did in late 73. The questions underestimate the force of Sakharov's heretical views 
and the jealousy with which the Communist Party guards its monopoly over social thought. To challenge this monopoly as Sakharov has done is to threaten the bedrock foundation of the system, for if in modern age managers and engineers can run the economy and administrators and bureaucrats can manage the government and diplomacy without ideological guidance, the party is left without legitimacy and raison d'être. That is why the party reacts so violently to Sakharov's ideological opposition. His own radicalization over the years, reflecting his mounting despair over the possibilities for, for reform within the system, has sharpened the confrontation. He has been influenced, too, by his second wife, Yelena Georgievna Bonner, an Armenian Jewish dissident activist whose mother spent 16 years in the camps. She and Sakharov married in 71, and his descent has since taken on some of her fire. As a prestigious government scientist in 68, Sakharov began his unofficial protest with a philosophical, carefully reasoned memorandum marshalling rational arguments for detente and greater intellectual freedoms. It condemned the foulness of Stalinism and the influence of neo-Stalinists, but it balanced criticism of Soviet repression with critiques of capitalism and American policy and strongly affirmed Sakharov's profoundly socialist viewpoint. For this 68 memorandum, Sakharov was fired from the Soviet nuclear program, but his ideas circulated wide, widely and his prestige soared among scientific liberals for whom he had emerged as a daring spokesman. Within five years, however, he had become a pariah who was raising an anguished cry for persecuted dissenters in mental hospitals for Armenians secretly tried and jailed for advocating national separatism for Jews who wanted to immigrate for nonconformist Baptists persecuted for giving their children religious training. He had been arrested for joining in the protest vigil at the Lebanese embassy over the killing of Israeli athletes at the 72 Munich Olympic Games, and his censor of Soviet society had become harsh and sweeping. I am skeptical of socialism in general, Sakharov declare, declared in July 73 to Ole Stenholm, a Swedish radio correspondent, in an interview that caused Stenholm's expulsion and led to the press campaign against Sakharov. I don't find that socialism has brought anything new in the theoretical plane or a better, better social order. We have the same kinds of problems as the capitalist world, criminality and alienation. The difference is that our society is an extreme case with maximum lack of freedom, maximum ideological rigidity and this is most typical with maximum pretensions about being the best society, although it certainly is not that. Already in the series of statements, Sakharov had advocated wide reforms, an electoral system with multiple candidates, establishment of newspapers and publishing houses, free of party and state domination, decentralization of economic controls, development of a private service industry, abolition of party control of key appointments, and honest, honest acknowledgement of negative aspects of Soviet life as a basis for reforms. He attacked the vaunted Soviet system of free education and medical care as an economic illusion, based on underpaid doctors and teachers and offering very low quality of services. He condemned the pernicious effects of the hierarchical class structure in which the party government intellectual elite enjoys open and secret privileges, 
such as better schools, clinics, special stores, and a system of supplemental salaries and special envelopes, and he protested that militarization of the economy posed a threat to peace because, in no other country, is the proportion of national income which goes to military expenditures as high as in the USSR, over 40%. Most controversially, he came to regard West Western pressure as the main hope for liberalizing Soviet society. Privately, I heard him plead for Western liberals to protect harassed Soviet free thinkers with their public protests and to keep their own countries strong and united as a counterweight to growing Soviet might. Publicly, he issued appeals for Congress to exact a price for trade concessions to Moscow, no equal tariff treatment, or large long-term credit unless the Kremlin opened wide the doors to free immigration. He reasoned that if the Soviet leadership could buy high technology from the West without being forced by the West to liberalize internally, the Kremlin would lose all incentive to free its own scientists and intellectuals. On the fifth anniversary of the August 21st, 1968 Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia, he called foreign reporters to his apartment to read a chill warning about the danger of a false detente. Detente without democratization in the Soviet Union, detente in which the West, in effect, accepts the Soviet rules of the game, would be dangerous. It would not really solve any of the world's problems and would simply mean capitulating in the face of real <clears throat> or exaggerated Soviet power. It would mean trading with the Soviet Union, buying its gas and oil, while ignoring other aspects. I think such a development would be dangerous because it would contaminate the whole world with the anti-democratic peculiarities of Soviet society. It would enable the Soviet Union to bypass problems it cannot resolve on its own and to concentrate on accumulating still further strength. As a result, the world would become helpless before this uncontrollable bureaucratic machine. I think that if the taunt were to proceed totally without qualifications on Soviet terms, it would pose a serious threat to the world as a whole. It would mean cultivating a closed country where anything that happens may be shielded from outside eyes, a country wearing a mask that hides its true face. Yet when Solentsyn issued his manifesto attacking the Soviet system, Sakharov was aghast. He did not rush to agree, for they were poles apart, like the westernizers and Slavophiles of 19th century Russia, I remember Sakharov sitting in a faded bathrobe and slippers on his daybed one evening, distraught at the news from an academic friend that a group of his university students were enthralled by Solentsyn's vision of a holy Russian renaissance. What alarmed him was the powerful potential appeal of such a vision. He felt impelled to challenge Solentsyn publicly, though their to force Theretofore, they had been careful to stand together because of the relentless pressures both faced. In that very Russian way, Sakharov spoke of how he bowed deeply before Solentsyn's morally powerful exposés of Stalinism in Gulag Archipelago and other works. But he was appalled by Solentsyn's religious patriarchal romanticism, as he put it, Solentsyn's mystic mistrust of modern science, his Slavophile aspersions on the West, his isolationist retreat into Mother Russia, 
away from world trade and from global cooperation on world problems of hunger, health, and the environment. In his public rebuttal, Sakharov praised Solentzin, the novelist, as he had in private. He found common points in their rejection of Marxism as the official ideology and their hope that Eastern Europe would be relinquished by the Kremlin and their desire for intellectual and cultural freedoms, including freedom of religion, but he attacked Solentzin's authoritarian streak as anathema and charged this that his great Russian nationalism was a leaf entirely out of the arsenal of semi-official propaganda. He said it smacked of the notorious military patriotic indoctrination of the Soviet populace throughout the Cold War. He went so far as to suggest that the thrust of Solentzin's Slavophilism, though advanced with peaceful intent, bore echoes of Stalin's approach. During the war and up to his very death, Stalin gave broad reign to tamed orthodoxy, Sakharov warned. These parallels with Solentzin's proposals are not only striking, they should put us on guard. The breach between the right and the left wings of Soviet descent had been opened and was irreparable. Roy Medvedev, the third corner in the triangular debate, is the personification of the cool distant. He is queasy at the combative mentality of rebels like burly, bearded Pyotr Yakir, who had been schooled in the Stalinist camps. Quite deliberately, he steers clear of the passionate moral indignation of either Solentzin or Sakharov. He has always maintained the sober, dispassionate stance of the thoughtful armchair reformer with practiced pragmatism, he has issued statements both with an eye to their impact and to timing them so that it would be awkward for the authorities to strike back without embarrassing themselves in the West or raising an undesirable scandal at home. Long before meeting him, I sensed that Roy was a study in carefully calibrated nonconformism. He did not seem to say all that was on his mind. His protests were often couched in the stilted rhetoric of Soviet communism, framed to appeal to hidden moderates within the party apparat, protected by his declared devotion to reviving some true, pure form of Marxism-Leninism, purged of the, of the sinful deviations of Stalinism and Neo-Stalinism. Privately, some other distance, scoffed that he was merely an establishment liberal, seeking more flexibility to permit him and his ilk greater access to information and publications from the West, and a less restricted life for themselves, without really transforming Soviet society. More than once, I heard more radical distance comment sarcastically that the Medvedev brothers, Roy and Zoros, were the only true believers left because in their idealism they envisioned Soviet communism with a human face, but the implication that this somehow reduced their descent to nil was unfair. Roy Medvedev took the risk of publishing in the West his book, Let History Judge, a fat thoroughly documented scholarly, scholarly indictment of the Stalinist police state two years before Solentzin's Gulag Archipelago appeared. His twin brother Zors has written books chronicling the suppression of Soviet genetics under the scientific dictatorship and false biology of Trofim Lysenko exposing Soviet controls, hindering East-West scientific exchanges, and dissecting the unseen workings of Soviet male censorship. Together, they wrote A Question of Madness, 
a shocking yet antiseptically told account of how Zors was lured into a mental hospital in 1970 to silence his dissent and how Roy raised an international scandal to get him out during the final torrent of hostility against Salinson over Gulag Archipelago. Roy dared circulate essays praising the book for its accuracy and condemning Salinson's deportation as a moral defeat for those in power who were neither willing nor able to answer his accusations about Stalinist terror. Stalinism is the issue that drives Roy Medvedev's dissent. At 13, with Zors, he saw his father a former political commissar in the Red Army during the Russian Civil War and later a party instructor at Tomashev Military Political Academy, dragged away in the middle of the night by Stalin's secret police in 38. Their last contact with him was a bristly, unshaven hug. They never saw him again. Stalinism was the issue when I first met the Medvedevs, or rather met Zors because Roy preferred to stay in the background. Zors was born 20 minutes earlier than Roy, and for a long time it seemed to me that perhaps this narrow seniority made him the bolder and more daring of the two. Zors was the first to get into scrapes with the authorities, publishing his distant works abroad first, venturing far sooner to meet Westerners officially, acting as a go-between for Salinson, trying to maneuver his way into an international gerontology conference in Kiev in July 72, only to be carted away by the KGB. Roy joined the party in 61, Zors never did, but was thrown out in 69 for a statement that had warned against plans to rehabilitate Stalin. Yet, it is Roy who has produced the more sustained political critique of Soviet society and offered proposals for reform, especially in a new book on socialist democracy, much of which I had read in Russian while I was in Moscow. In late 71, when I met Zors, he was trying to help Roy escape the secret police, an episode that had comic moments. Roy had suddenly quit his job at the Institute of Pedagogical Sciences where, as a former teacher and school principal, he had written tracts on education. His unauthorized book on Stalin was about to appear in the West, and with good reason he feared reprisals. His theory was that if he waited for the axe to fall, he would be blacklisted for life and harshly punished. So, he had decided to quit first, go into hiding, and lay low until the controversy cooled. But before he could make a move, this secret police had a stakeout on his apartment building. Roy and Zors are look-alike twins, trim, nearly six feet tall, with handsome oval faces and silvering hair, yet far younger looking than most Soviet men at fifty. So closely do they resemble each other that even good friends have mistaken one for the other. Reveling in the gamesmanship, Zors explained how he had tried to outwit the stakeout by passing in and out of Roy's apartment building several times in hopes that the secret police would follow him off by mistake and let Roy escape. But the ploy had not worked. I guess they have assigned good men to the job, he chortled. Nonetheless, Roy did manage to slip off in a wig and disguised as a woman. He hid out for several months in the South. When he returned, he could not get back his job or any official work. He lived on Western royalties and his wife's salary, his immunity from harsher punishment, left me wondering if he had sympathetic protectors in the governing apparat. It was close to two years before I met Roy. 
By then, Zors had gotten out to England to pursue his career as a biologist and to represent both brothers to Western publishers. Roy, working still as a freelance historian and essayist, was the most meticulous, most organized Russian I ever encountered. Actually, his father was Russian and his mother was Jewish. He followed a disciplined work routine and did not let his strictly limited social life interfere. He rarely went out, totally avoided movies and television, read voraciously, and kept voluminous files in extraordinarily good order. His habitat was an immaculate little study lined with books on three walls where we used to talk sitting only five or six feet apart with two shortwave radios playing different programs in the background to foil any room bugs. Roy was as fastidious as an accountant and terribly proud of it. Once when I remarked on how precise and organized he was, a smile corner curled the corners of his mouth. When I was a senior in high school, I had already figured out how I was going to organize my files, he explained. I have changed my system a number of times, but I have always known how to lay my hands on any piece of paper. Even the KGB has been impressed with his archives when they searched his apartment in 72. They took only three hours, Roy recalled with pride. They immediately understood that they had found a business-like man and that the files contained what the labels said they contained. That is why they could get done so quickly. By comparison, he said, a search at the home of another distant, whom I knew, a writer of enormous vitality and charm but deliciously disorganized, would have taken them four days. Even more astonishing to me was the fact that Roy had not had to engage in an endless wrangle with the secret police to reclaim his files, a hopeless task in any case, because years before he had developed the practice of duplicating all his material and keeping a spare set in a safe place. So after the secret police had carted off his archives, he fished out the second set and was back in business. This unruffled equanimity was Roy's trademark. It was a piece it was of a piece with the careful calibration of his protest, his calculated tactic of refraining from extremes that would make the authorities feel compelled to garrot him. Unlike Sakharov and Salentsin, he pointed out to me he had not been attacked in the Soviet press. Moreover, he said he had let officialdom know his basic lines of research. Indeed, the Stalin book was launched in 62 during Khrushchev's de-Stalinization with the idea of having it officially published in Moscow, but by the time it was finished in 68, the party line had changed and Stalin's rehabilitation was underway. Still, the manuscript was shown to party officials. In part, this explains why Roy took pains to make it palatable, treating Stalinism as pseudo-communism, a perversion profoundly alien to Marxism-Leninism, rather than a fundamental flaw of the system, and why he so gingerly treated the little Stalins of Soviet life now high officials who had fattened their own careers with the help of the Stalinist purges. Even when writing about contemporary Soviet life, Roy has avoided attacking the party head-on, but has criticized neo-Stalinist deformations and conservative dogmatism. In short, Roy Medvedev is an unusual phenomenon among distance. He constitutes the loyal opposition. Publicly, he has chided other dissidents, including Sakharov and Zelensky, for provocative behavior or extremist views. 
Although his own descent has deepened in recent years, he is above all a pragmatist, a gradualist who envisions reform evolving slowly in the Soviet system, essentially decreed from on high, but in response to pressures from an alliance between the best of the intelligentsia and the most forward-looking individuals in the governing apparat, but not without periodic backtracking and retrenchment forced by neo-Stalinist. Again, his approach made me wonder, as others have, whether Roy speaks for a hidden liberal faction inside the party, but Roy was careful with me to insist that he spoke only for himself, though he made no secret of long-time party connections. Moderniz modernization, he used to tell me, will impel the system toward greater democracy over the long run. Copying machines and eventually television broadcasts relayed from abroad by satellites as well as foreign radio broadcasts will make it impossible for authorities to keep the lid on the spread of information and ideas. The needs of the modern economy, he felt, would force decentralization of economic management and relaxation of what he regarded as the clumsy cumbersome, cumbersome over-centralized mechanism of state planning and control. Over two or three generations, he predicted the Soviet Union will evolve toward a multi-party system. Some of his criticisms of the Soviet system sound very much like those of Sakharov in earlier years. Indeed, in 1970, they joined in one important critique of the Soviet system, along with Valentin Tershin, a Soviet physicist, a mathematician, and author of one of the few Soviet computer languages. Roy has directed his fire against the ruling bureaucratic oligarchy, against ideological controls that he feels have fossilized communist ideology by suppressing genuine debate against the system of privilege and administrative rigidity. He has called for reducing the size and power of the swollen party apparatus, for experimenting with Yugoslav-style worker self-management in industry, and freedom for the non-Marxist opposition to come legally into the open rather than being forcibly repressed. He has urged far greater freedom of information in science and academic life, offering to a hidden audience of party liberals the lure that greater flexibility and relaxed controls will put new life into Soviet communism, which he feels has lost popular appeal. A process of normal political debate will only promote the development of Marxist-Leninist ideology and the formation of a new, more capable generation of communist leaders. He contended in On Socialist Democracy, published in English in 75, at times Medvedev has sounded as though he was preaching. Dubchek dub Communism though he criticized the Czechoslovak reformers for pushing too hard too fast. At one point, answering Solentsyn in the spring of 74, he called for absolute freedom of speech and convictions, freedom of organization and assembly, freedom to propagate religion, free elections open to candidates from a variety of political groups and parties, but always within the framework of a socialist system, but at other times he has hedged. He has ridiculed Soviet censorship for being so rigid that even Marx and Engels could not pass the censors if they were writing today, but asserted that press freedom must be limited to protect not only state secrets, but party secrets and professional secrets, and for all his talk of other parties, he leaves in doubt whether any but the Communist Party could actually wield power. 
more important, the whole temper of his descent differs from both Solinsen and Sakharov. Medvedev strikes a detached philosophical pose and an air of patience where they are trying to mobilize others to speak out and press for changes today. His differences of viewpoint with Solinsen are fundamental. He dismisses Solinsen's religious Russophilism as both unappealing and unrealistic. Religion, he, re he reasons, cannot attract enough people in the modern age to serve as the underpinning for society. And if Solinsen's scheme were imposed, it would run the danger of degenerating into a repressive theocratic state, an echo of the Spanish Inquisition. Roy Medvedev's disagreement with Sakharov has emerged more subtly. For several years, they stood together publicly, despite private differences, joining in appeals for liberalization and relaxation of controls in all walks of life. But when Sakharov urged the West to pressure Moscow into reforms, Roy's pragmatic loyalist streak forced him to break with Sakharov. When Sakharov was warning the West against a false detente, in which it risked being hoodwinked into helping the Soviet regime strengthen itself and narrow the technological gap, I heard Roy insisting privately that if the United States put preconditions on trade and credits, the insult of ultimatums would anger the Kremlin and backfire. Come December 74, he held up Moscow's cancellation of the Soviet-American trade agreement as evidence. Roy's position was that the West could influence Soviet handling of individual cases, but that Sakharov and others were overestimating Western influence on the general situation inside the Soviet Union. In the long run, Roy reasoned, Western leaders would lose interest in Soviet, Soviet internal reforms and problems. His hope was that over 10 to 15 years, tendencies toward reform within the Soviet leadership <clears throat> would be fostered by increased contact with the West through the through detente. But he was an honest enough historian to acknowledge that during the first couple of years of detente, the pressure against dissent even increased and repressive measures tightened. Sakharov's own position is a case in point. He was vacationing on the Black Sea in August 73, when the flood of officially inspired vilification against him broke loose. He and his wife <clears throat> were lying on a beach near Sochi, his wife told me, when they overheard transistors broadcasting a stream of vitriol against this renegade scientist who had sold his soul to the West, no mention of his role in helping make the Soviet H-bomb around them Knots of vacationers fell into the mood, talking about Sakharov cursing his disloyalty and his supposed opposition to detente, while he lay among them unrecognized. Sakharov's wife wanted to get away quickly, but Sakharov lingered on. He approached one group and, after listening to them, scold him, inquired whether anyone actually knew Sakharov or had read what he had written. No one had, yet for all the conventional skepticism about Soviet propaganda on other matters, these people had taken it as face value on Sakharov. Quietly, still anonymous, he suggested that it would be worth knowing what Sakharov had actually said, because perhaps he is a man with good intentions after all. Unable to bear it any longer, his wife hustled him off the beach out of fear that he might be hurt if people discovered his identity. The propaganda onslaught against Sakharov ended abruptly on September 9th after protest from Willy Brandt, Austrian Chancellor Bruno Kreski, Swedish Foreign Minister Christer Wickman, and a warning telegrammed to the Soviet Academy of Sciences from Philip Handler, the head of the American Academy of Science, harassment or detention of Sakharov, Handler apprised sternly, will have severe effects upon relationships. 
between the scientific communities of the USA and USSR and could vitiate our recent efforts toward increasing interchange and cooperation. That touched a vital nerve. The Kremlin obviously felt that the price of carrying the campaign against Sakharov to its ultimate conclusion had become too high. Western intervention had thus proven a deterrent against the possible arrest of Sakharov. He had been questioned and warned by the Deputy Procurator General and the Secret Police for detention in a mental hospital and expulsion from the Soviet Academy which the party apparat had desperately been trying to engineer behind the scenes. It was a victory, but a py pyrrhic one, for the Kremlin had already succeeded in crippling Sakharov's influence among his natural constituency, the Soviet scientific world. He had become an isolated and demoralized man. Tens of thousands of scientists had read his first memorandum on peaceful coexistence in 68. According to Moscow scientists, whom I knew and yet very few had seen any of his major subsequent declarations, which had been sharper, I heard this not only in Moscow, but from a physicist in Novosibirsk in western Siberia and a biologist in the Moldovian capital of Kishnev, among others, both the public propaganda campaign accusing him of opposing detente and the private whisper campaign that he was a bit wacky took their toll. Respect for Sakharov has fallen over the past couple of years, a medical scientist told me in late 74. People consider him an eccentric, a bit feeble-minded, strange, emotional, unpredictable, when this man learned that I knew Sakharov personally, he questioned me closely about whether Sakharov seemed mentally normal and what he was like. He wanted to be sympathetic to Sakharov, but he was weary. His attitude recalled the apt observation of Lydia Shokovskaya, the writer so little understood by outsiders, and so revealing about the way Soviet life actually moves, that soundproof wall built by the authorities methodically and with malice between the creators of spiritual values and those for whom those values are created has grown higher and stronger. Assiduously, intellectuals were driven into one or two camps by the authorities, either into open dissent to be prosecuted or made social outcast, or to become collaborators of repression. This, according to Valentin Tertian, the distant scientist, was one of the main purposes of the regime in getting so many prominent scientists, writers, scholars, and intellectuals to join in the collective vilification of Sakharov and Solentzin. His reasoning was that these people felt morally compromised by that act, so guilty that no matter what their private views, they would go on participating and denouncing all nonconformists. Tertian, a slender, soft-spoken, and self-effacing scientist, had felt the heat of this hounding personally. He paid dearly for his own loyalty to Sakharov. During the virulent outpouring of late 73, he had been almost alone in defending Sakharov. Retribution was swift. A mass meeting <clears throat> was organized at his institute, the Institute for Computer Systems in the Construction Industry. It was one of those classic criticism sessions where the institute director, the party secretary, and other workers publicly chastised Tertian for siding with Sakharov. Some called for him to be fired though he was temporarily spared when the campaign against Sakharov ended, but immediately he felt the chill of ostracism from colleagues who privately sympathized with him, and he fell to analyzing what he called the technology of oppression in the era of detente. 
There is an unbelievable cynicism among people, he remarked one evening. The honest man <clears throat> makes the silent ones feel guilty for not having spoken out. They cannot understand how he had the courage to do what they could not bring themselves to do. So they feel impelled to speak out against him to protect their own consciences. In the second place, they feel that everyone everywhere is deceiving everyone else based on their own experience. Homo Soviticus is like the prostitute who believes that all women are whores because she is. Soviet man believes that the whole world is divided into parties and that every man is a member of one party or another, and there is no real honesty. No one stands for the truth, and if anyone says he is above the party and is trying to speak the truth alone, he is lying. This cynicism greatly helps the authorities keep the intelligentsia in line and exclude the wild, dis the wild dissidents from society. People can travel to the West and hear Western radio broadcasts, and it makes no difference, so long as there is the pervasive cynicism that it is just the other side speaking. This cynicism provides the stability of the totalitarian state today in place of the fear of the Stalinist years. Sakharov himself told me that he had been effectively ostracized by all but a few friends like Tertian, hardly any of the other top scientists who used regularly to frequent his dasha still paid him visits after the 73 campaign. For establishment figures, private contact with him had become poisonous. His own friends and supporters suffered. Valery Chalidz and Andrei Tvedokovlov, the two younger physicists who had joined him in forming the Human Rights Committee, were fired from their jobs. Tevdoklov was eventually arrested. Threats of Siberian exile became so intimidating to Shalids that he accepted the out of going to America. In the summer of 74, Tertian was fired from his job for social reasons. As the euphemism went and effective economic blacklisting forced at least four other institutes, to reject him because he would not pledge to keep quiet. When I last heard from him in October 75, he still had no work. The KGB had interrogated him several times, searched his apartment, and seized his typewriter and many of his private papers. He was trying to come to America as a visiting scholar before being arrested and carted off to Siberia, but the path to immigration was being blocked. Too. Sakharov admitted privately to me that after the 73 campaign against him, he had become so disheartened that he had applied for permission to go to Princeton's Institute of Advanced Studies and had tried to arrange for his stepson, stepdaughter, and her husband to be admitted to MIT for what would obviously be permanent exile. Theoretically, his own appointment would be for a year but he recognized he might never get back to Moscow if he ever got out. Mainly for that reason, he dropped the idea of going abroad himself after Slenson had been forcibly deported. He felt morally obliged to remain rather than leave Soviet dissent without any commanding voice, but the tensions of anonymous death threats against his children and his grandson, the administrative harassments against his family, the refusal for many months to let his wife go to Italy for medical treatment to keep her from going blind were wearing him down. Although the award of the Nobel Peace Prize in October 75 undoubtedly gave him and his small band of friends a lift, his protests were increasingly those of a single voice rather than one joined by a chorus of supporters. In mid-75, he cried out in pain against threats and thuggery against his family, who he said were being used as hostages against him. 
nor was this merely Sakharov's personal plight. It reflected a more general retrenchment of Russian descent. Various nationalist groups in Lithuania or Armenia, or religious groups like the non-official Baptists, issued periodic collective appeals and protest, but dissent, but dissent among the liberal Russian intelligentsia was disintegrating as the 70s wore on. If the great debate of the super distance briefly displayed the substance and vitality of their ideas, it also demonstrated that such outspoken nonconformism had increasingly become a luxury of the world famous. What had rather pretentiously called itself the democratic movement, a loose coalition of a few hundred distant intellectuals, had been dispersed, deported, and demoralized by the mid-70s. Many people who had once shared, shared Roy Medvedev's hope of liberalizing Soviet society from within were overcome by a sense of futility. The contrast was striking with the early 60s when crowds gathered in Pushkin Square for open poetry readings in defiance of authority, or the mid-60s when literally hundreds of establishment scientists, writers, scholars, and cultural notables took the risk of signing petitions protesting the trial against Andrei Sinyavsky and Yuli Daniel, who were charged with illegally publishing anti-Soviet works abroad under pseudonyms. This triggered a wave of mass protest in from 65 to 8. We all hoped then that by openly opposing the system, things would eventually get better, an elderly Moscow writer told me. It was an uneven struggle, and we knew it. We had hope, but it got us nowhere. Now, what's the use? I remember in fall 72, in the first flush of detente, after the Nixon-Brezhnev summit, talking with a successful Moscow mathematician who was explaining why he was so reluctant to sign a protest against a new round of political trials in Czechoslovakia. This was a change for him because formerly he had been active in circulating petitions. It's another nothing paper, he said in despair. Your conscience tells you that you cannot be silent but you know nothing will come of it. We tried it, and it made no difference, except that more people got hurt. He was referring to the scores who were ousted from the party and fired from jobs for signing the earlier protests. The sense of futility and disenchantment affected even the most hardcore activist. When Sinyavsky and Daniel returned from long years in Siberia, they did not rejoin the ranks of active dissenters, but kept quietly to themselves. Natalia Gorbanyevskaya, a young poet, put in a mental hospital for her part in the brief Red Square demonstrations against the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia, came out of the hospital and went back to poetry and raising her child rather than activism. Others, too, laid low, like Larissa Bogoraz and Anatoly Marchenko and Alexander Ginsberg, all forbidden by the authorities to return to Moscow. Marchenko was eventually sent back to the forced labor camps in 75 for coming back into Moscow, and Andrei Amalric, another prominent distant, was threatened with the same fate when in the fall of 75 he tried to resume his activism after six years in Siberia. To me, it would have seemed logical that the very dawning of detente would have encouraged Soviet intellectuals, especially scientists and scholars, to rally to the ideas of Sakharov and the Medvedevs for much freer and more direct exchanges of visits and information with the West, yet the silence on such issues was deafening. What happened was that the authorities closely controlled all channels of travel and contact with the West and used the opportunities for East-West exchange 
as a new source of leverage for enforcing ideological conformity. Often I was told stepping out of line, let alone open dissent, was an immediate pretext for dropping a scientist from a delegation going abroad or excluding a scholar from taking part in meetings with visiting Western groups. I knew personally of cases where those who fraternized too freely and were too talkative with Westerners were dropped on the next trip. People became anxious to keep their records clean <clears throat> and to demonstrate reliability. You Americans really don't understand how our system works, a young biologist chided me. You assume that Taunt will automatically open up our system. For the reliable party scientist, it is a good thing. They get to travel again and again. The rest of us have to be on our best behavior if we want to stand any chance. So you see, Detente gives the authorities a new way to reward and punish us. A middle-aged movie script writer who had traveled to Eastern Europe but never had been permitted to go to the West was acid in his comments. I know writers who will sign any statement, make any denunciations of Sakharov or whomever the authorities want, to get something published or to get a trip abroad, he said angrily. I know a scientist who will stop at nothing for a trip to, to Japan. You should understand what an insidious thing this is. Ninety percent will do that. They would <clears throat> inform even on their own colleagues for a three-week trip to Japan. The technology of repression has become more refined in recent years. Roy Medvedev commented to me, before, repression always went much further than necessary. Stalin killed millions of people when arresting a thousand would have enabled him to control people. Our leaders have never known how to go just far enough and not too far, but they have found out eventually that you don't have to put people in prison or in a psychiatric hospital to silence them. There are other ways. The very emphasis of Solentzin and others on Stalin's mass terror has blinded outsiders to the more subtle yet powerfully coercive mechanisms of the Soviet 70s. Modern Soviet authoritarianism is more efficient, though not as totally effective as Stalin's brand because the near-perfect conformism of public life is achieved with much less physical violence. People are already conditioned to conform. The KGB remains a formidable apparatus, some 500,000 strong by knowledgeable Western estimates. Here and there, I became aware of it as I was tailed on the streets of Yerevan or Riga, entertained by police plants in Central Asia, who muscled more normal citizens away from my dining tables, or had my tires punctured outside Sakharov's apartment under the watchful eye of a late-night taxi. My strongest visual impression of the awesome human resources of Soviet security services came when President Nixon arrived in Moscow in late 72 of May. He landed at Venukovo Airport, about 20 miles southwest of the heart of Moscow, thousands of gray, uniformed policemen lined the route out to the city limits. Behind them, you could see a second line of men in plain clothes, whose ranks continued out past the militia all the way to the airport. Mile after mile, these shadowy figures hovered amongst the trees every 20 yards or so. I couldn't help wondering what this enormous manpower pull did in normal times, tailing people, bugging telephones, compiling dossiers, interrogating and blackmailing, searching, arresting. The Bolshoi Ballet gave a special gala performance of Swan Lake in Nixon's honor and the hall, I was told later by Russians, was packed with KGB officials and their families plus a sprinkling of other government and party faithful. According to people in the Bolshoi company, some KGB contingents 
were bussed in from provincial cities to ensure an absolutely reliable audience. A musician in the Bolshoi Orchestra complained later to friends that it was a dead hall that night with no warmth. You could feel that these people had not come for the performance, he said. They simply didn't respond. The archipelago of Soviet labor camps in the 70s has a population of 1 to 2 million, depending on which Western estimates you believe. The Soviets never say, including 10,000 to 20,000 political prisoners from Ukraine, Lithuania, Armenia, and other national nationalists. To religious believers who refuse to serve in the armed forces or insist on giving their children religious training. To the democratic distance known in the West, it is a sizable contingent but a far cry from the millions of political prisoners incarcerated by Stalin. Not only are the numbers lower but the totally unpredictable and arbitrary terror of the Stalinist error has abated. Most ordinary people can keep clear of the KGB, though complete dossiers are kept on everyone by the personnel section. Pervy Otdel, <clears throat> the first department in every Soviet factory, institute, agency, or collective farm, even distance will admit that they know they are consciously taking the risk of arrest with their protest, whereas ordinary people who stick to the party line and avoid political nonconformism are not normally harassed by political police. For those who stay out of line, who stray out of line politically, the most effective and widely used method of control is economic blacklisting, a technique used in the West during the witch hunts and red scares of the past, but far more crippling in a centralized economy where the state is effectively the sole employer and where the individual has a workbook that carries <clears throat> his lifetime work history showing his status political as well as professional, and where every institution has its pervy at del checking on the political background of new employees. Westerners may have largely forgotten the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia, but Soviet liberals are very conscious of that year as the time of repression, and especially economic reprisals and blacklisting, because the Kremlin feared that the infection of Czechoslovak liberalism was spreading among the Soviet intelligentsia. Brezhnev seems to have been particularly vexed by what he saw in Prague on a visit in late February of 68, for he came home to make a major speech warning that Soviet renegades cannot expect immunity. Russians took it as an omen of an imminent crackdown. Indeed, Mikhail Augursky, the systems analyst who had related some of the inner workings of Lenin Library, told me that he, ha he and other Jews suddenly found that jobs promised them were withdrawn that spring, for Jews had been promised among the protest signers, had been prominent among the protest signers, and administrators were more wary of taking them on. Several mathematicians at Moscow University were, were reprimanded, and some were eased out of their jobs that summer. The same with nonconformist scientists, in institutes from Leningrad to Novosibirsk in western Siberia. Waves of dismissals and demotions put a chill on intellectual life. I have heard of too many such cases to enumerate, but a couple will convey the power of the state as a monopoly employer to bring nonconformists to heel. A friend told me about Leonid Petrovsky, a Communist Party member from a family of loyal Bolsheviks whose grandfather had been the first president in 22 of what was to become the Supreme Soviet. Petrovsky himself had a good research post at the Institute of the Museum of Lenin in Moscow. As events were unfolding in Czechoslovakia, 
and in Moscow, Petrovsky, like others, feared a new Stalinist wave. He spoke against Neo-Stalinism in various closed meetings and privately circulated writings that warned of a trend toward rehabilitating Stalin. One of his articles was published abroad in Sweden. Instantly, Petrovsky was expelled from the party and fired from work. Previously, he had made money on the side by doing newspaper articles on Soviet history and ideology for central newspapers, but now that avenue was blocked. For a while, he slipped a few articles into distant provincial newspapers where his blacklisting was not yet known, but soon that too dried up. His family had a hard life, a mutual friend told me. His wife was an ordinary teacher. She made less than a hundred rubles a month, and they had two children. It is impossible for four people to live on so little in Moscow. Petrovsky could not get any work at all. They were desperate because of his family background. Petrovsky appealed to the Central Committee to give him a job somewhere. There was no answer. Many times he appealed. Still no answer. Finally, after a long while, at least a year, I know, they called him in and gave him work at the state archives. Now he is in no mood to make any protest. He is a good man, honest but quiet. He is afraid. The permutations of this technique are infinite, but the intent and effect are almost always the same. I met a sad-faced art historian, a large lumbering man with melancholy eyes and a look of hurt innocence, who had been driven mercilessly from every job he had found in the course of seven years because he had signed one petition, only one on behalf of Sinyavsky and Daniel. Illegally, he had been fired in 1966 from the art publishing house where he had worked for many years. He went to court to contest the bureaucratic maneuver by which he was ushered ushered out of his post. It was useless. He told me the judge privately admitted being ready to decide the case in his favor until secret instructions came from higher up to rule against him. Later, the man got occasional jobs in a school in an institute as an archivist in a library, and eventually he was so desperate he even took a job carrying books in the stacks, but always the political police caught up with him and he was fired. When I met him, he was out of work, numbed by his hopeless position and dependent on his wife's modest salary as a university language teacher for support. He had a lifetime of unemployment ahead of him, for he was far less well-connected than Petrovsky. I knew writers blacklisted for nearly a decade who survived only because of working wives or because friends in the literary world smuggled them work to be published under pseudonyms. Other people, though not fired, had careers stunted merely for guilt by association. Take Anatoly, a talented, promising, and likable young physicist of 30 at an institute in Obanisk, about 80 miles from Moscow, in 69, as a party member, he wrote a letter to the Provincial Party Committee in Kaluga, gently suggesting that they re-examine the cases of two scientific colleagues sternly reprimanded for minor political deviations. His was a private confidential letter in conformity with the party rules that members address higher-ups with problems. The politically savvy understand, of course, that this is a myth and they keep quiet, but Anatoly was conscience-driven to defend his friends. The scientific council at his institute was convened. Its chairman instructed the other 32 council members that Anatoly's letter showed he was politically immature and recommended that he be demoted for that, I was told, was what party headquarters had ordered. Although 
the other council members liked Anatoly and knew his professional talents, only one man spoke on his behalf, asking why such a fuss was being made over a mild letter. Immediately, several others turned on this man, attacking him for going against the line laid down by the chairman. No one else dared defend Anatoly. A vote was taken by secret ballot. All 33 members voted for the motion, even the man who had originally defended Anatoly. I heard several other stories for collective sanctions, where everyone did the party's bidding, even against his own conscience, and despite the protection of secrecy, some distance called that pliant uniformity our greatest shame. <clears throat> None of these three, Petrovsky, the art historian, or Anatoly, were hardcore distance, like many others, they were passively disaffected, except for an occasional overt act. Yet blacklisting the motions and economic pressures were enough to bring them to heel and to intimidate an entire segment of Soviet society, which would otherwise have provided a constituency for Sakharov and undoubtedly would have joined the trend of the late 60s toward increasingly open debate and dissent. But over the past five years, the Brezhnev-led coalition effectively turned back the clock from the ferment of the early 60s and the greater activism of the mid-60s and reimposed effective controls on this amorphous but important element of the intelligentsia in its tactics toward hardcore dissidents the regime was much harsher but less inclined to overkill than previously some dissidents attributed this greater sophistication to yuri andropov who became head of the secret police in 67 and who is widely regarded as the most intelligent member of the politburo detente to imposed a need for greater circumspection Crackdowns were avoided at sensitive moments, such as the impending visit of a major Western leader, a critical period in East-West negotiations, or before a trip by Brezhnev to the West, out in the provinces where foreign diplomats and newsmen had no access, roundups and trials could go ahead without hindrance. But in Moscow, the secret police timed their reprisals carefully and cannily. Distinguished between famous dissenters whose tribulations would arouse sympathy and protest in the West and the minor obscure figures whose demise would pass unnoticed and without danger to the climate of detente. Sakharov and Solentsyn might be spared the harshest sentences but their friends fared less well. I have already mentioned the harassment of Sakharov's colleagues. After Solentsyn was exiled, one of his friends, a cyberneticist named Alexander Gorlov, who had accidentally come upon police agents ransacking Solentsyn's summer cottage in 71, was unceremoniously fired from his job and thus blacklisted for life for his one act of friendship. Far worse, a frail young archivist named Gabriel Supperfin, who had worked part-time as an amanuensis for Slenson, was dragged off to the provincial city of Orel, held incommunicado for eight months, and then after emerging in court to repudiate a confession extracted during relentless interrogations, was sentenced to seven years in camp and, and Siberian exile for doing far less than Solentsyn himself. Such cases are innumerable, for Soviet authorities, with perverse consistency, recognize rank and importance among distance, just as among the hierarchy of officialdom itself. People of prestige simply get away with actions or statements that would send unknown distance to their doom. Lydia Chukovskaya, the iconoclastic writer who was eventually expelled from the Writers' Union for sheltering Solentsyn and supporting Sakharov, 
pointed out several times that little people in outlying cities were being tried and convicted for merely possessing some of her anti-Stalinist writings in protest, whereas she, partially protected by notoriety and family connections, was still free. This deliberate double standard not only isolates but torments the more famous dissidents who are haunted with the sense of guilt that others risk more for speaking their minds than they do. Another demoralizing technique used by the KGB with enormous effectiveness has been to set various factions of dissidents against each other and to play upon the natural self-protective wariness of dissidents who must always be on guard against informers. I remember the painted, the pained look of one writer as he described how the secret police had planted the cancerous slander that he was one of their agents, poisoning his relations with others. The sakharov solintsyn medvedev debate, though not of the KGB's making, had a tragic, acrimonious personal side that set the shrinking band of distance at odds with each other. But the most celebrated and devastating case was that of Pyotr Yakir, whose father had been one of the top Soviet army generals, purged and executed by Stalin in 37. As a boy of 14, Yakir had been sent to the camps, where he spent 16 of his 30 years. By the time I met him, he was nearly 50, a bold, shaggy-haired, friendly, hard-drinking, roguish dissident whose earthy, outspoken anti-Stalinism and fearlessness made him a father figure to younger distance. For correspondence, he had become an important channel of information, and for obtaining the bi-monthly Chronicle of Current Events, the main dissident publication, a dispassionate record of their activities and repressions against him, Akir's flamboyance and indiscretions worried more careful dissenters who feared his circle was penetrated by informers Sadly, they turned out to be right. In late 71, the leadership decided to crush the Chronicle and its network of correspondents and distributors. By mid-72, they focused on Yakir and his friend, Viktor Krasin, another veteran of the camps. Both were arrested, held incommunicado for months, and eventually broken by interrogators to the point where they falsely confessed links with anti-Soviet Emigre groups abroad and implicated many other people. Scores of intellectuals in several cities, perhaps as many as 200, were interrogated and some forced into soul-wrenching confrontations with Yakir and Krasin, who urged them to admit activities, some real, some false, because the KGB already knows everything. The impact on distant morale was shattering. Too many had regarded Yakir as a rock of reliability and were unbearably disillusioned when he began to talk disillusioned not only with him but with any hope for cooperative efforts to liberalize Soviet society. It is so painful, too painful to talk about, a Leningrad distant told me. No more for me, said a gray-haired Moscow translator, it shows that organizations are dangerous politically and morally, politically because you can be arrested by the police, and morally because any organization can be infiltrated and corrupted from inside. Paradoxically, detente provided a final windfall to the secret police for dealing with dissidents too well known to be easily suppressed without scandal and too strong-willed to be, to be turned into informers. For them, the new technique was expulsion. Actually, it was not entirely new as a tactic. Lenin and the early Bolsheviks had gotten rid of important anti-communist intellectuals the same way in the post-revolutionary period. Stalin banished his rival Trotsky in 29. In the 70s, Solintsyn was the prime target. In a swift maneuver, Soviet authorities deported him and rid themselves of their most prickly internal critic. However troubled the West might be, it was powerless to reverse his deportation and relieved 
that Salinson had not ended up with a bullet in his brain or condemned to rot away his final years in Siberia. For Moscow, his deportation was an extremely successful move. Six months later, his books were still hot contraband among disaffected intellectuals, but he was a far less palpable force and influence. Without many people in the West taking notice, an entire school of the more defiant and outspoken intellectuals was dealt with this way. Pushed out to the West, like Salinson, most of them lost in the flow of Jewish immigrants. Though some were not Jewish, Mistlov Rostoprovich, the cellist, Joseph Bradsky, the poet, writers like Viktor Nakrasov, Vladimir Maximov and Anatoly Jacobson, Andrei Signavasky, the satirist and literary critic Valery Chalidis, the physicist Alexander Yanov, the publicist Alexander Galak, dramatist and underground balladeer Yefim Etkin, noted philologist and friend of Slentson, among others. Some people were bluntly warned by the KGB that they could either get out to the West or be shipped off to Siberia on an endless cycle of trials and convictions. Pavel Liv Litvinov's case is a classic example of the new tactic. The grandson of Stalin's foreign minister, Maxim Litvinov, Pavel is a tall, husky, rather Irish-looking young man, with a gregarious smile and unaffected directness of manner. He was exiled to a squalid, distant, and miserably cold village in Siberia near the Manchurian border as one of seven participants in the August 25, 1968 demonstrations in Red Square against the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia. <clears throat> Although trained as a physicist and sent to an exile village, which had no physics teacher in its local school, Pavel had to work as a manual laborer in a floor spotter mine. Where he returned, when he returned to Moscow in December '72, he found it impossible to get regular work or to get re-registered for residence in Moscow with his wife and two small children. In the Yakir investigation, he was interrogated and blackmailed with offers of work and a resident permit if he would cooperate with the KGB. He refused. Somehow, he managed to get private jobs tutoring high school students in physics and translating scientific works from English, and also to regain his Moscow registration. But he was drawn back into his human rights campaign and had several run-ins with the secret police. Events reached a climax on the evening of December 5th of 73, as Pavel headed for the brief annual human rights vigil in Pushkin Square. Half a block from the square, he was surrounded by four men who said they were from the KGB. They ordered him to go with them. I refused, Pavel later told me. I asked to see their identification. They refused to show me anything. The leader, a short, stocky man with wide shoulders and a boxer's face, an unpleasant face with his nose pushed in told me, if you do not come, there will be a fight and then you will get 15 days in jail for hooliganism. So I agreed to go. They led him to a local police station where the leader took Pavel to a little room and talked to him for 20 minutes. Rather humorously, Pavel called the pug-nosed agent my sponsor in the KGB for he knew everything about my case, my life history. My private life, my family, he was probably in charge of me. Oh, Litvinov, the KGB man said, you are really going back to your old business again. Of course, you must understand that we will not tolerate this. We will not stand for such things. It is better for you to stop this business or you will be in much worse conditions than last time and for many years. Pavel took this as a clear warning of a long term in the labor camps. But then came the alternative. I know you have an invitation from the West and from Israel, the KGB man said. If you apply for an exit visa, it will be the best solution for all. Otherwise, you will go East. 
the alternatives were clear. He didn't promise me, but there was mutual understanding, of course, Pavel said. They must have known how I was feeling because I had, I had made no secret of how discouraged I was about my future prospects. I had even talked with friends about going abroad. Of course, the KGB prefer for people who are well known in the West to go abroad rather than to send them to Siberia because there is less of a scandal. Within a month, Pavel had applied to emigrate, and two months later, he was in America. It was a pattern repeated in a number of important cases with the same choice, go west into oblivion or see yourself slowly destroyed here. A fair number, like Litvinov, chose the west, and the dissident movement lost them for good. We are so alone, lamented one woman who stayed behind. First Solentsin, then Nekrozov, Galak, Litvinov, and all these others. Living in Moscow now is like living on the moon.